Good evening and welcome to Word and Sword TV broadcast brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ meeting at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. And we're just real glad to be with you this evening. We want to thank you for tuning in. We have so, several of you who are regular uh, viewers of our program and we thank you for that. And uh, we hope that you won't be disappointed as we go through a study of God's Word this evening. We're, going, we're continuing to talk about conversions after taking a little break for some questions that some had that we needed to cover and that was on the Holy Spirit. And we do want to refer you back to those if you would. The last two programs have been involved with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. So if you would write in to the program or call tonight if you would like some information on that subject. It's a subject that sparked a lot of interest with many of you. And we have those available. If you would like a copy of those in either hard copy or printed form or presentation form, we can provide those for you. Or you can go to www.wordandsword.com and you can get those, uh, those uh, past programs. Uh, we're going to put that information up here for you right now. And if you will, look at this, www.wordandsword.com, www.wordandsword.com. Please go to the chart, please. All right, www.wordandsword.com, and you can also call and get any of the presentations we've done before. And you can ask for a free tract, or you can ask for how to get to the building. And uh, if you need a ride, you uh, just call in and we'll make sure that you can have a ride to the building. Some of you are not able to drive, or uh, and maybe you just um, just need a ride. And uh, just let us know. Call in and we will do our best to try to come get you. Phone number tonight is 828-485-5555. That's 485-5555. And call in. The operators are standing by right now to take your call. And if you would like a tract, a Bible tract, uh, when a tract is nothing but a sermon that is put down in printed form, if you would like one of those uh, on the Holy Spirit or any number of other subjects, just call in and we will be glad to provide those to you free of charge. Again, everything we offer on this program is free of charge. This program is funded fully by the contributions of the saints at Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. And we do not solicit money from anyone uh, that calls in. We don't, want to, we don't sell prayer cloths, we don't sell doilies, we don't sell uh, holy water. Uh, we just want you to call in and uh, study God's Word. We also have a Bible correspondence course, two of them, uh, that if you would like, uh, please avail yourself of those. You can go online and, and take one of them uh, without even having any mail problem there. Or we can mail them to you. You just let us know about that and we'll be glad to get those to you. And again, we thank you so much for tuning in this evening and we ask you if you would to continue to tune in. You can like us by going to Facebook at www.facebook.com slash word and sword or you can go to www.facebook.com slash Newton North Carolina Church of Christ and notice the case difference there on Newton and also on North Carolina. Also you can follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword and you can post Bible questions up there and we will be glad to have a conversation with you by that medium and uh, we would appreciate it. If you would give us your comments about the program we have several of you who have visited our site recently and we thank you for that. But uh, www.wordandsword.com is a tremendous uh, uh, website and maintained by the members of the Newton Church of Christ. 828-485-5555. Get your phones ready. Get ready to study the Bible. Get your Bible out. And check to be sure that what we're teaching tonight is from God's Word. And if you find it to be so, then don't just let it be something you say, well, you know, that was the truth. The truth is to be obeyed, friends. It's not some suggestion. It's not some option. Truth is truth. And there's only one truth. And so we must believe the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And that's what we are designed to do here at this program, is to present the truth. And that is our hope and our prayer that you will hear the truth here. If you don't, then you will be my friend if you will call in and let me know where I have not preached the truth. Give me a scripture that I have violated, and I will be glad to recant what I've said. But if you do find the book, the chapter and verse that we give, 
for the things we teach to be true, then we ask you to believe the word. And we're here not to promote ourselves or to promote anybody except Jesus Christ. And we're not here just to promote a church, we're here to promote the Lord and His Word and get people in the book. Too many people have strayed from the book, folks. And that's why we're in the shape we're in, both in religion and in this country. It's too many people have gone away from the message of Jesus Christ. If we'll all go back to the Bible, if we'll all just put aside our ideas, let God be true and let all of us be liars. That's what we need to do. That's the old time Jerusalem gospel. That's the old time teaching. That's what Jesus wants us to do. And so if you have your Bibles tonight, turn over to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, and we'll get started in just a moment. What does it take to be saved? Well, you hear a lot of people that would ask that question and you would have a lot of answers given. Some would tell you, you don't have to do anything to be saved. Some would tell you, well, you have to confess Jesus. You have to just believe Jesus. Others would tell you, well, you just got to change the way you live and be sorry for doing that and maybe stop drinking or stop uh, cussing or something like that and then you'll get to heaven. Others might tell you, well, no, you have to, you have, to have faith, but grace, grace is what saves you and so that's it. Well, let's look and see what the Bible says. We have a chart here that we want to refer, refer you to about the words of Jesus and then later on the words of the apostles. In John 12, 48, the Lord says, that, or we were told that we are supposed to hear what the Lord says. Hear ye Him. Hear the words of Jesus. In Romans 10, 17, we see there that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. In John 8, 24, except you believe that I am He, you'll all die in your sins. In Hebrews 11, 26, verifies that teaching of Jesus when it says without faith it's impossible to please Him. Galatians 3.26 says we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then we look at Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, except we repent, we'll all likewise perish. They were told in Acts 2 to repent and be baptized, every one of them. In Acts 17 and verse 30, we were told there that the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now He requires all men everywhere to repent. And then we see that Jesus said, if you confess me before my Father, or if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 10, 32. In Acts 8, 27 through 39, it was the Ethiopian eunuch, who upon hearing what God's Word said about salvation said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we know that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 10. Most of the time we have agreement on the first four of these. People will say absolutely, and in the religious world there is very little division over the first four of these. But notice what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16. Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And we see that followed through on in Acts 2 and verse 38 where they are told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. In Romans 6, 4 through 6, we find that baptism is a likeness of the death the burial and the resurrection of Christ. And in Galatians 3.27, we find we put Christ on in baptism. And in 1 Peter 3.21, we find that baptism saves us. It puts us into Christ. Well, if we fulfill all these commandments, even baptism, if we do all of these things, and remember, these are all authorized by Jesus, and they are not competing for one another's attention. We just can't pull out a passage, for instance, like Romans 10.10 or Galatians 3.26 and leave out what the rest of the Bible says about belief. We can't just pull aside uh, Luke 13.3 or Acts 2.38 and say repentance is all a person has to do or confession only or repentance only or belief only or hearing only or baptism only. We have to take all of what God's Word says. What does God say about the subject of salvation? And we'll see that we'll see that there are several things that are talked about in the Bible to save us. They do not compete against one another, they work together. God's not the author of confusion. So we can look and see what we're supposed to do. So after we have been baptized into Christ, the Lord adds us to His church. And we are to be faithful in service to the Lord. Come back to me, if you will. 
So if you and I fulfill the commandments that are given by Jesus and by the apostles, we are born into the family of God. We are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And the Lord adds us to his church, Acts 2, 47. We are Christians and Christians only, Acts 11 and verse 26. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. They weren't called a particular brand of Christian. They weren't called Baptist Christians or Methodist Christians or Mormon Christians. They were called Christians, just simply Christians. And that's the only name that, God's, that Jesus' followers ever have except disciples. We are Christians, we are disciples, we are followers of Jesus Christ, which is a disciple of Christ. We are Christian by name. We follow Jesus Christ. And we're expected to serve him faithfully until we die. We can forfeit our salvation. We can sin in a way to where we separate ourselves from God. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 have five churches that separated themselves, were on their way to separating themselves from the Lord. And he says, unless you repent, I'll remove my candlestick from among you. Second Peter 2.22 says, one who has once followed the Lord and then goes back to the ways of the world, that he's like the sow returning to the, to the uh, mud and the uh, dog to his own vomit. That's pretty distasteful. But we see there that we have to serve until we die, Revelation 2 and verse 10. So that demands a faithful service, a continual allegiance to what we have committed to. Not a, like many people look upon marriage today, a commitment for a while as long as you're happy, and then when hard times come, you're ready to go. No, the Lord wants us to be faithful to Him. And our commitment is the most important commitment we will ever make. If you are listening tonight or watching tonight and you are not a Christian, the most important decision you'll ever make is to be obedient to Jesus Christ. It is not a light matter. It's not something you take on without counting the cost. And look and see if you're ready to pay the price that you need to to be a Christian. You have to be willing to give it all up for the Lord. He didn't, he didn't ask us to become poverty stricken, but if we did, we wouldn't let that bother our service to the Lord, would we? Because the Lord will provide the things necessary for us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, if we seek the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will add. A Christian will never go hungry because his brethren will help him. See, that's how it goes. That's God's plan. And it works, by the way. Well, we invite you to assemble and to attend the assemblies of the Newton Church of Christ, and these are the assembly times. They meet at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Each Sunday, the Bible study is at 930, and the worship is at 11. Please go to the uh, charts, please. And then Wednesday night's Bible study is at 7 o'clock. If you would, please go to the charts. There we are. Each Sunday morning, Bible study is at 9.30, worship is at 11, and Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. All right? So go visit with the Newton Church of Christ. Also, the Word and Sword, this program, is brought to you solely by the Newton Church of Christ. Again, we say we do not want any money. You can contact the Newton Church of Christ by going to email at contact at wordandsword.com. You can contact them by phone by going to 828-465-3009 and leaving a message there, if you will, at the building. Or you can contact them by mail by going to P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. And again, the website, which I, I strongly encourage you to go to, is www.wordandsword.com. Virtually any question you might have about the Bible Material is there, or resources are there for you to find the answers as you go there. And again, you check anything we have on our site, you check it with the Bible to make sure it is true. Don't take any man's word for anything. You check out, you search the scriptures to see if what's being said is true. Tonight, for the rest of our program, we're going to be talking about the conversion of Cornelius and his household. Now in Acts chapter 10 is where we're going to find the story of, of uh, Cornelius, the first mention of him, but we'll find it also in Acts 11. And we'll find it also in Acts chapter 15. There'll be some mention of that and reference to it. 
The conversion of Cornelius is an important subject for all of us because most of us that are watching this program tonight, with but few exceptions, are most likely Gentiles. Everyone who was not a Jew in the first century was a Gentile. And so that meant the Greek world, the Roman world, was all Gentile. The Egyptians, anyone else other than a Jew, was a Gentile. And Cornelius was the first Gentile convert. Now someone says, well, why was that? That was God's plan. Remember when Jesus said, go out and preach the gospel, he said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Acts chapter 1, or Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, if you'll look there, Jesus said to the apostles, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the world. And there is your separation for the book of Acts. That's your outline for the book of Acts. Verse 8 of chapter 1. From chapter 1 through chapter 8, or into chapter 8, we find there that that's the Jerusalem section. Later we see the next section of the book of Acts is the Judea and the Sumerian section. And then most of the book of Acts is the uttermost parts of the world in the journeys that Paul took to different areas. So Cornelius and his household's conversion was the first instance of a Gentile conversion. And we're going to talk about that tonight because it's important that we study our heritage, isn't it? The gospel is opened, the door is open to the Gentiles. Remember that Jesus had told Peter in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 18 and following that he would give unto him, unto him the keys of the kingdom. And that was not just to him, but all the apostles. And we see there that the preaching that would be done would be to all mankind. And no notice the lesson that Peter preached in Acts 2 was to not only would the gospel go to the Jew, it would go to the Gentile. And that was according to prophecy of Joel. And that would be upon all mankind that the gospel would be poured forth. But God had in mind that it first of all go to his people, the Jews, his chosen people. And then it be open, the door would be open when God chose to the Gentile. And it, again, if you'll look in, in Acts 10 tonight, we'll talk about this a little later on. But we're going to see that Cornelius and his household were uh, very, very devout people. They were very good people. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Can, is just being a good person enough to save you. If it is, Cornelius would have been saved, wouldn't he? Well, our studies so far, with the exception of the last two programs on the Holy Spirit, for about the last six weeks have been on the conversions in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, for instance, we studied about the 3,000 that were converted on the day of Pentecost. What did they do? They were told to repent and to be baptized every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And then we see in Acts 8 verses 4 through 12, as the, as the Judea and Samaria section start, as Christians are scattered, or scattered around, we see that the Samaritans are preached to. And then in Acts 8 verses 13 through 25, we see that Simon the sorcerer is converted. He's a man that is a magician. And he thinks that even after he's converted, that the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that the apostles had, who were called from Jerusalem to lay hands on the people of, of Samaria, that there was some type of parlor trick to that, and he wanted to buy the trick. And Peter says, you just repent of that, of the thought and the intention of your heart. This man had just been converted, and he was in danger of losing his salvation right then. Well, we see also in Acts 8, verses 26 through 40, there's a man called the Ethiopian eunuch or the Ethiopian treasure. And he was the treasure for the king of, uh, for the queen Candace of Ethiopia. And he was a very trusted official. He was evidently a proselyte Jew. Now, a proselyte Jew is a person that may be a Gentile, but they are one that has adopted entirely the Jewish religion. They've been circumcised, they've been involved in that, and that's been part of that. They have come under the conditions of the law. Now, proselytes, even a proselyte under the old law, did not have access to the same privileges that the natural-born Jew did. 
So the proselyte was always going to be, even though he adopted the law of Moses, he would always be an outsider, not on equal basis with the people of God. Well, notice that Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9 and Acts 22 and Acts 26, he was Saul of Tarsus for a while and he was a persecutor of Christians, a very wicked man as you and I would look at it and as Christians would look at it. But he did everything he did in good conscience. Saul was a religious man, but he was religiously wrong. So in all of these conversions, we'll talk about some others in a moment, pardon me, <coughs> we're going to see that each one of them represents people of today. As you look today, there are people that are good religious people, just like Saul of Tarsus was. Argument could be made, you would seldom find a man more religious than Saul, but he was religiously wrong. What did he do when he found out that his religion was not right? He didn't say, well, this is the religion of my fathers. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Pharisee. I've studied the Bible all of my life. I've studied the Septuagint. Not only that, I was taught by some of the best teachers that are out there. Theologically, I am way above most people of my time. I'm a mover and shaker in my religion. I'm not just some lackey out here. I'm not just some person that just warms a pew. I'm a person that, uh, that puts people to death if they're not following the Jewish ways. And what, what did he say when he was convicted of his sins? He obeyed the gospel. And from that point on, he was more than zealous. Again, argument could be made, he's one of the most zealous people that ever lived for the cause of Christ. And he gave it all up. He gave up his old religion, folks. Do you have that conviction? If you find out by a study of God's Word that your religion is wrong, that what you've been doing in all, in all good conscience, like Saul of Tarsus, that it's wrong, do you have the courage of Saul to walk away from it? And to teach others that you have, lo have grown to love in that religion, that they should walk away from it also. See, not just take care of your own soul, but warn others of the same problem and tell them, I used to be just like you, but I found out what the truth is, and I want you to hear it because I love you and I love your soul. Do we have that conviction? That's an interesting question for all of us to answer, isn't it? Have you examined your religion enough to know whether you're right or wrong from the Bible? We're going to talk about that a little later. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, which we'll study tonight, is the story of the first Gentile convert, our ancestor. Lydia in Acts 16, and also the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, are the beginnings of the church in uh, Philippi, in the Macedonia area. And then in Acts 18 and Acts 19, the Corinthians being converted, and the Ephesians being converted. Again, Gentiles, all Gentiles, from Cornelius, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, the Corinthians, and the Ephesians. All Gentiles. And so we see the Gentile is brought under the, under the, under the law of Christ and is a subject to the law of Christ. The Gentile to that time had been under the law of the patriarchs. God had law for the Gentile all the way to the cross. But now the Gentile is under the law of Jesus Christ and is amenable to that law to be as obedient as any Jew was. And we find out something in interesting. You know that the Jews, to a large degree, continued to follow after uh, those who were teaching the gospel of Christ and tried to kill them. The Gentiles, however, seemed to be very receptive to the truth even though they didn't have the religious background that others did. What does that tell us? That tells us that a lot of people who can quote their Bibles, who may have, and you may be one of these, I've heard many of you who have called in, said, I've read my Bible through three or four times. Good for you. That's awesome. Read it through four or five more times. But when you read the Bible, digest it. Don't just read it to get through it for the year. And that's one of the dangers of these read through the Bible in a year programs. 
we can get through, so, uh, so involved in reading through something that we forget what it's talking about. Now certainly there is a time to just simply read the Bible. But as we continue to grow in our study of God's Word, we want to stop and we want to pause and digest what He's saying. And that's the value of Bible study. You will never, ever mind the depths of everything God has in mind for us. As you grow in, in your Bible study, you will find that there are things that you are putting together from the Old Testament and the New Testament that you never even got before. And that's a beautiful thing for you. That's the, one of the beautiful things about the gospel. It's like a diamond. There's so many facets to it that you can never seemingly discover all of them as long as you live. And that keeps us hungry, doesn't it? Blessed are those, Jesus said, who hunger and who thirst after what is right. Do you hunger and thirst for what is right? Are you willing to find out what is right? Are you willing to take this book as your guide? for your rules of faith and practice in the religious matters of this life? Are you willing to let it regulate your life when it comes to the way that you live? Are you willing to put aside the things that you have been doing and turn, to th turn toward the Lord and all that He has said? Are you willing to do all of what Jesus said? Again, we're going to talk tonight about the man Cornelius and his household. What happened with Cornelius? The account of his conversion is, uh, is in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 1 through 48, and it's recounted by Peter in Acts chapter 11 and in Acts chapter 15, where he recounts to other brethren what happened, because he's telling them, Peter is telling them that the door to the Gentile is as open now as others. Remember that during this time period, there's an extreme amount of bigotry between the Jews and the Gentiles. Not so much on the Gentile part, but on the Jews part. They thought that the law of Christ was wonderful. Even Christian Jews thought that the law of Christ must be obeyed. But when the Gentile was brought into the kingdom, which the prophecy said he would be, and if they believed that the Jewish people believed the Old Testament, they would have known that the Gentile would be involved in the new law. But when that happened, the Jews were ready for that to occur if the Gentiles would be circumcised. And so the question comes up here with Acts 11 and Acts 15, where Peter is making sure, and he becomes, Peter was a pretty big bigot himself. But now, and we're going to see that tonight as we study in Acts 10, but we're going to see in Acts 10 and or Acts 11 and Acts 15 that he involves himself in telling other people, his own people, to not be bigots anymore and to accept that the Gentile was under the same law they were under, that the law of Moses was over. And so as we study together tonight from these chapters, let's look and see what we have. Now when we talk about the conversion of, the, of Cornelius and his household, let's go back and pick up some of the things that we've talked about in previous lessons. All right? Now, what does conversion mean? All right? As a verb, it means to bring over from one belief or view or party to another one, to bring about a religious conversion, to alter the physical or chemical properties, of, especially in manufacturing, to change from one form to another to alter for more effective utilization. And that's Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the new edition. In Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, and Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now the little children were being brought to Jesus and he said, you must become as little children. And if you're like a little child, not being childish, but in your innocence and in your receptiveness to what is good and kind and wonderful, your purity. If you're ready to receive me as a little child does these little children, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. In Acts 3 and verse 19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, be changed. What? Why? So your sins may be blotted out. 
so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I don't know anyone that doesn't want to be refreshed and doesn't want to be in the presence of the Lord in their quiet moments. They may act like they don't want that, but when they reflect on that and have a mature moment, they have to long for refreshing times, for times that are not full, filled with guilt. But we have to be converted to have those times so that our sins may be blotted out and we don't have to carry the guilt of our sin around with us anymore. Conversion is not merely a change in action, friends. In Acts, Luke 15, the prodigal son committed himself to a certain plan of action, but it was not completed until he followed through, was it? He had a change in his knowledge. He used to think that being in the world was wonderful, but he changed that when he was in the pig pen. And he developed some conviction to do what he knew was right. And so it moved him to a change in allegiance. Going back to his father, he had been going to the world and his friends. A change of thinking, and a change of his will, and a change in his commitment. And it resulted in a change of his relationship with his father, and a change in his identity. He was no longer an heir to the household. He was like one of the servants. But his father, he was willing to do that. But his father said, oh no, I give you position. So conversion is a change in who we are. It's a change in how we talk. It's a change in where we go and what we do. And we might add to that is a change in wanting to do that. We desire to talk like the Lord. We desire to go where the Lord would go. We desire to do only that which the Lord would do and worship the Lord in the way that He would want us to worship. Total all-in commitment to the Lord and to do it with zeal and not for what we can get out of it, but because of our love for the Lord, not because we're made to. The law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord, the psalmist says, is sure, and it makes wise the simple. It's more to be desired than gold, even than precious gold, and sweeter than a honeycomb. Well, as we look, and look, at, look at the man Cornelius, we see here an illustration of a centurion. What is a centurion? Well, he's a Roman for sure, and he's a Roman soldier, but he is over a band of about a hundred men, That's hence the word centurion. Cornelius, before his conversion, and watch this, in verses 1, 4, and 22 of Acts 10, and let's just read those. There was a certain man of Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. And then we read verse 4, when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said, your prayers and your alms are come up for a memorial to me. Verse 22, we see here, arise and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So this man was a good man. It says he was in verse 2, a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house. He gave much alms to the people and he prayed to God always. Now, is that a good man? Ask yourself, would you want to tell this man, if he asked you what he needed to do to please the Lord, would you tell him that he wasn't pleasing the Lord? Again, this is a man who was a good person in so many ways, as we would evaluate it. But what about how God evaluates it? Well, we'll say a good person today. Who, what is a good person? Are you a good person? What is a good person? Well, we say a good person, I would say, most of us would agree, that a man that doesn't throw beer cans in your yard is a good person. A man who doesn't kick your dog is a good person. A person who does not, you know, burn down your house, they're good people. A neighbor who doesn't rob you is a good person. Someone who's not a drug addict, they're a good person. A person who's not in jail is a good person. But we're looking at it from our viewpoint, aren't we? We're looking at it and we're calling good by our definition. And the Lord's going to bring that up here to Peter in just a moment. 
He's going to tell Peter a little bit about that. In the conversion of, the, of, the, of Cornelius and his household friends, there were miracles involved, there was the necessity of preaching, and when there was compliance to what was being preached. There was obedience. And who does that? Well, Cornelius could have insisted that he was fine by himself, that he didn't need to do anything. After Cornelius' conversion, what changed? He wanted Peter and his company to stay with him a few days, most likely to learn more about his new faith. That's in verse 48. But again, who was he before? He was a soldier. He was faithful to Rome, which was a decadent country, a decadent empire. But he was faithful to the Caesar. He had sworn allegiance to the Caesar to defend the nation of Rome, the Roman Empire. He had a hundred men under him that he captained. He was in a band of the Italian band, which included five to six hundred people. So he was in a particular group of men that were elites. We might look upon them as the seals. He was a very trusted Roman soldier. And he was a religious man. What did he do that was religious? Well, he was called devout. Remember what we read in verse 2? He was very religious. He was godly in his behavior. And he was fully devoted to God. He prayed. He gave alms to the poor. He even helped the Jews with their, with their building projects. He let his money follow through on his conviction. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. But he was one of those that was a good Gentile. He feared God. Verse 22, verse 2, according to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, a righteous man fears the Lord. And he feared the Lord, he and his household. Not only had he do, had, did he do it, but he taught his family to be this way and those of his servants, his close servants. So this is a man that is not only good himself, but his influence has been felt by others. And they've changed. What do you do with a man like this? Do you tell him he's lost? Do you tell him that he's not going to be saved in the, st in the state he's in? This is a good man as men look at it. Good man as you and I would look at it. But as God looks at it, this man needed to be saved. This is a man that is the good soil. And the Lord saw this good soil. And he says, this is the man through whom I will bring the gospel to the Gentile. Again, this was a kind and a caring man. Even though a Roman soldier, hardened by battle, he had a kind streak and a caring streak to him. He cared for those that were less fortunate than he was. By the way, as a centurion, he would have had prestige. And so he was a good man, much like Daniel was in the courts of the Babylonians. As a Jew in the Babylonians, this is a, this is a Roman soldier that was held with, by contempt by a lot of Romans, particularly the zealot group. They wanted to kill him. They hated Rome. He represented the Roman Empire. This was a good man, though. A good man. But he was honest, he was sincere, he was devout, he was a fearer of God, he was very benevolent, but he was lost. Now what does that tell us? What does it take to be saved, folks? Being devout? A lot of people are devout. They're convinced that the way they're going is right. Fearing God? A lot of people that are very respectful of God, hold Him in awe. Is that all? What about being benevolent and helping people? and making sure that those less fortunate are you than you are taken care of. Is that enough? It wasn't enough for Cornelius. And friends, let me suggest tonight, it's not, no, it's not good enough for us either. It's not good enough to just be good. It is essential that we are good, 
But that in and of itself does not seal and punch our ticket to heaven. It just does not do it. So what does it take? What does it take for us to be what God wants us to be? Remember this was a time when mostly Jews were members of the body of Christ or proselytes. And this man's conversion is used to prove that Gentiles are, can be saved just like the Jew. No difference. So we have a military man, we have a Gentile, we have a centurion, we have a man of power and authority. He's a good man, he's a devout man, he fears God, he's a benevolent man. But he is sincere in what he does. He's sincerely wrong in his beliefs and what he's doing. Now let me tell you something, folks. When a person has this type of character, he will not balk at what he hears, and we're going to see that in just a few minutes. He's not going to uh, set his foot down and say, I, I don't, I'm, not go I'm going to be right no matter what. I can't, I'm not going to, because uh, if I admit I'm wrong, somehow my, my value will, will go down. No, he knew that being devout and fearing God like he should, he knew that he needed to do what was right, even if it meant turning his back on the things he had been practicing that were wrong. Now, he continued to do the right things, and, but at the things that weren't right, he had to turn his back on them. Well, this man had a desire. He had a desire to know more about what God wanted him to do. Now, we'll read a little bit about in, in chapter 10, and if you have your Bibles, let's just go through here. That this man, who was a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house, reading from verse 2 of Acts chapter 10, he saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of the Lord coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. That's because he feared the Lord. And he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Your prayers and your alms are come up for a memorial to me. And now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, lodging in the house of one Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he'll tell you what you, watch this, what you ought to do. All right, now why in the world would he want to tell him what to do if he didn't need to do anything? Like some people say. Just mark that, verse 6. When the angel which spake to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them and waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So three men go down to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up upon the top housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they were made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending to him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts and of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, and it said, Peter, kill and eat. And watch what Peter says as a Jew. Peter said, O oh, no, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And the voice spake to him and said, the second time, and said, What God has cleansed, do not call unclean or common. And this was done three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen would mean, the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry for Simon's house, and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether, whether Simon, surnamed Peter, was lodged there. And so Peter thought of the vision, and the Spirit said to him, These three men seek you. Get up and get down there and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men that were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, I am the one you're seeking. What, are you, what is the cause whereof ye have come? And they said, Well, Cornelius, the centurion, watch this, a just man and one that fears God 
and is of good report from all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for you into this house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and his near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Peter said to him, took up them, him up and said, Stand up, I myself am just a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto, him, unto them, Ye know how that an unlawful thing, it's an unlawful thing for a man that's a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So I came unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I asked therefore for what intent you have sent for me. Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting till this hour. About the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayers heard, and your alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging at the house of one Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who when he comes shall speak unto you. Immediately therefore I sent to you, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. So Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God's not a respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Now the word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ, that he is the Lord. The word I say ye know that was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. And then he goes on and gives the lesson, and he commanded us to preach to the people, verse 42, and to testify that it is he who was ordained of God to be judge of the quick and the, and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness, and through his name Whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. And when Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. And they of the circumcision that believed were astonished, as many as it came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And Peter answered and said, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost just as we? And he commanded them to be baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ, and prayed that they, that prayed they him to tarry certain more days. Well, that's the entire story of what happened with Cornelius. Let's go at, let's go through it a little bit. Cornelius, before his conversion, was a man who prayed all the time. Now we know that God does not is not bound to answer the prayers of the unrighteous. But his prayers went up as an alms to God, as a sweet savor. The Lord listened, the Lord heard his pleas, and sent Peter to teach him. This man was a just man. He was fair and he was honest. We see in verse 22 that he was respected by both Jews and others, even though he was a foreigner. Now for a Jew to respect a Roman centurion, that's a mouthful right there, that he was respected by them. So regardless, however, of his godly character, of his moral purity, of his sincerity, of his devotion and worship and his generosity and his conduct and his reputation. Folks, what we have, to, what we have right here is hundreds of people that you know today that are good people. Cornelius still needed, however, to be saved. He was not saved. He had not been baptized. He was a sinner that had not been obedient to the gospel of Christ. And notice what he asked for in, in chapter 10. He asked for somebody. He asks that somebody teach him the Word of God. Peter went up on the housetop to pray. Peter's vision was of unclean animals. Now what did that mean? 
Well, there were unclean animals and clean animals all the way back to the time of Noah. But now we see the Lord sends a vision to Peter of clean and unclean animals, and he says, kill and eat. Now, at this point, some of the animals that might have been represented there were things like catfish, shrimp, things along that line, that he was now able to eat. As a seafaring man, Peter was unable to eat some types of fish, even though he caught them. Unable to eat shrimp, even though he might have caught some of them. They were not able to be eaten under the old law, and he is a Jew says, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. He was devout. But the Lord tells him, he says, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. Don't you dare call it unclean. Now, the application of that is made by Peter himself later on. When he says, I was sent to you to teach you the truth. And I cannot call you unclean. The vision of the angels Cornelius saw that vision, friends. The miracles involved in the, in the conversion of Cornelius were notable. Cornelius saw an angel, but he was told to hear the gospel preached. So have you ever heard somebody say, well, I saw an angel, and that's how I came to Jesus. Well, here's a man that did see an angel, and he still needed to be preached to by a man. He needed to hear the gospel. Well, let's look at something else. Peter's vision of unclean, unclean animals prepared the preacher for the task of preaching to the, to the Gentile. Now, the Lord sent that vision to Peter so that he would go preach to the Gentile. Where did he go? He went to Cornelius. And this is a good man. Now, you can understand if Peter went to the house of Caesar or if he went to the house of some wicked person out there. But notice the Lord chooses a good man, a good Gentile. And friends, I don't think this is by mistake, do you? This is a very vivid reminder that we can be religiously devout. We can be convicted. I know of many of you, I've met some of you who watch this program. And I know that all of you, I've been in some of your homes and visited with you. And I want to tell you something. Some of you are very, very, very good people, the ones I've met. The very fact that you turn into this program and view it regularly, you're good people. But you have to ask yourself the question, am I saved? And am I saved the way the Lord tells me that I'm supposed to be saved? Not am I saved because my relatives and my religion from the past tells me I should be, or, to, or anything like that, or my relatives tell me I am, but have I checked it out by God's Word? Have I heard? We are all here present to hear. We are here to hear. Speak, Lord, thy servant hears. We're ready to hear and to do what God has said. Friends, whenever we come to worship God, we should come with the attitude that the Word of God is going to change me today. I may or may not like what it says, and some of you watching this program may be people that know the truth. You know it as well as I do or anyone else. You know the truth and you could preach the truth, but you don't like it right now. Because when you think about it, it just goes against everything that you're doing. I'll well, tell you something. You have to come to the cross, and the Word of God's not going to change because you like it or don't like it. When it comes to you and says, when the Word of God in His Word says, repent and be baptized, you may not like that, but that's not going away. You're going to be judged on the basis of whether you've done that in the last day. Like it or don't like it, deny it or don't deny it. But you must obey it, just like we all must. Now, had Cornelius walked away from this experience, this man coming to him to try to baptize him into Christ and convert him to the Lord, had he walked away from that, what would Cornelius' state have been? 
you would have still been a devout man. Had, had he continued to live the way he was, and he just went ahead and, and served the Jews and did what he could under the Jew, to the Jews to help them, he would have been as wrong as the Jews were who did not obey the gospel. He heard the gospel, and his heart was touched by it, and so was the hearts of those that heard him also that were accountable to God. And what did they do? They obeyed the gospel. Now, some other miracles that came in this passage, and let's not forget those, because we talked about it when we talked about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit baptism came upon only two groups of people, on the apostles and on Cornelius and his household. On the apostles, it was for a sign, and on Cornelius and his household, it was for a sign that the law had changed. The old law was over and the law of Christ was enforced to the Jew and to the Gentile. How was it referenced? How was it shown? In Acts 2 it was shown by the apostles speaking in tongues and each one understanding in his own language. It's done the same way in Acts chapter 10 and 11 and 15. Peter says, it happened to them as it did to us, Peter, talking, in the beginning. Now he's not talking in the Garden of Eden. He's talking in the beginning of the church in Acts 2. So on the day of Pentecost, cloven tongues of fire came upon them as the Holy Spirit descended as cloven tongues of fire, and they began to speak in tongues. All right? Now that was baptismal measure of the Spirit. And only two groups of people receive that. You don't receive that and I don't either. When we're baptized into Christ, we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 38 and 39 is the promise of salvation. And that was what was prophesied as our hope, the hope of all mankind in the Old Testament. And that only came through Jesus Christ. And so we have salvation through Christ, and we have a home in heaven because we are saved. Now, he didn't come to the, the Holy Spirit didn't fall on the Gentiles to save them. Nor did he fall on the, on the Jews to save them. He called on them as a, as a miracle. Things are changing. And miraculous intervention was taking place here. The Lord was showing by a sign that what was happening was he was validating the Gentile as a proper candidate for salvation. And by the way, that had to be done to get a Jew to preach to him. Okay. That's how bad the despite was, how bad the bigotry was. The Holy Spirit fell on them, Acts 10, 44. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon them, and they began to speak in tongues, Acts 10, 45. And they spoke with tongues, verse 46. It was as it did on the apostles in the beginning. Now watch this. The Holy Spirit fell on them, Acts eleven fifteen. Peter says, as it did on us in the beginning. Holy Spirit was poured out on them, reminding Peter of Jesus' promise in Acts 11, verse 16. And then the gift was the ability to speak in tongues, chapter 11, verse 17. Now the miracles involved astonished the Jews and the Christians who were with Peter. And they commented. They said, this is remarkable. Said, what's happening here is what happened on Pentecost. And it silenced the critics against Peter going to the Gentiles. Remember he said, it's not lawful for me to even be here. But he said, I was told to come here. Now, there, Peter understood that there was always going to be critical Jews that said, you did the wrong thing by going to those Gentiles. Boy, did you make a mess, Peter. Now we've got to deal with this bunch. No. Peter said, you don't have any reason to be silent. Now, if anyone had, had an attitude that would have lent itself to bigotry, it had been, it had been Peter. Remember, he was the one that drew his sword, struck the Roman soldier in the garden. And now he's preaching to one. That's remarkable, isn't it? You know what? The gospel changes people, folks. The truth changes people. Jesus Christ changes people. 
Here's a man who was probably the biggest bigot among the apostles, him and Simon the Zealot. And here you have him now preaching to a Roman. And the Lord sent him and he said, I'll go. I'm going to do that. Does the gospel change people? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? If you let it have its way with you, it will do that. Quit resisting it and you'll be better for it. To demonstrate the abolishment of the barrier between Jew and Gentile in Acts 10 and Ephesians 2, we see here that what happened, this convinced the Jews that Gentiles were to be accepted. In Acts 11 and verse 18, this is brought up by Peter when he gives a defense of this. Let's read Acts 11 and verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, God has also come to the Gentile and granted them repentance unto life. So the Jews recognized after Peter told them what happened, they said, okay, the Gentile is now one of the ones we can go preach to, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Again, these miracles were to remove all doubt that the Gentile must be baptized in order to be saved. Acts chapter 10 and verse 47, can any man refuse water that these should be, can be baptized or must be baptized also? Well, Peter couldn't withstand God and neither can anyone else, friends. And notice what he says there in chapter 11 and verse 17. He says there, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord, what was I that I could withstand God? How, what am I going to do, stand there and argue with God? Now you and I would look at that and we'll say, certainly not, Peter. When God talks to you, you have to say what you have to do what he's told you to do. Exactly. So who am I to withstand God? So who's Stan Adams to withstand God? And who are you? to withstand God. If God says something, what's it my obligation to do? Heard a man uh, illustration that I've used for years in a gospel sermon years ago. I heard him say, if God told me to walk through a brick wall, it's my job to start walking and God's job to either let me get hurt walking through it or walking into it or to open a door. But my job is to obey God. Whatever God says, I am to do. You believe that? If God says jump, my response is, how high, Lord? And absolutely, I will be your servant, whatever you want me to do. And I won't stand there and argue with him when he says repent and be baptized. I won't say, well, I don't want to do that. That's rebellion, folks. That's sinful. Who are you to withstand God? And who am I to withstand God? And who are we as brethren to withstand God when he tells them the course of the church? As the Lord wants the church to function, who are we as his servants, as his children to withstand God? Who are the Jews to withstand God and keep the gospel from the Gentile? Because they have their own ideas about who's a fit subject for the kingdom. Do you know what happened right here? The Lord is opening the gospel up to a community of people that the Jews found contemptible, that the Jews found unclean, that they found vile and wicked. And honestly, they were. There so were some of the Jews, weren't they? Do you know what it was like to be a Jew in the first century? Do you know what the Jewish law demanded of a person? There was sacrifice for unintentional sin under the old law, Deuteronomy 14 and 15. But as far as intentional sins, with but very few exceptions by God himself, was a person exempt from sin punishment for intentional sin. And so the Jew lived a very careful life. As you see the Jews portrayed now, uh, when we were in Israel recently, we saw people bringing their whole families to the wall, the West Wall. It's called the Wailing Wall. And they would come as families there. There were those who would bring their young sons to, uh, to be bar mitzvahed. Devout people 
religious people. In their appearance, they were willing to st stand aside from the crowd. They, the phylacteries that you hear about in the Bible, many of the men had boxes that were woven into their hair that had scriptures in them. Outwardly, as Jesus said, they appeared very religious. But Jesus said inwardly they were painted tombstones. Why did sepulchers? A Jew gave special attention to being pure and doing the things that were right because he did not want to intentionally sin. Now was he a sinner? Yes. But he wanted sacrifice for his sins. Wanted to be able to offer a sacrifice for his sins. But notice that under Christ no matter why we sin, whether we intend to or don't intend to, under the blood of Christ, and one of the beautiful things about the new law is that we can be forgiven of all sin. So can the Jew. All sin can be forgiven. And if I do it over and over and over again, and I repent over and over and over again sincerely, guess what? The Lord forgives me. Now, let me hasten to say, that does not give us the right, Romans 6, to say, well, since God will forgive me as one of his children, I can just do anything I please, and then say, oh, forgive me. Nope, can't do that. That's not an out, because you're not repenting. You're just reporting. And folks, there's a large deal of difference in repenting and reporting. The Lord's, Lord knows what you've done. You don't have to report that to him. He wants you to change. He wants you to change the way you live. And so you just don't go up to God and say, I'd like to report to you, Lord, I did this and did that. Well, are you really sorry about it? Nope, not really, but I didn't need to tell you about it, Lord, because I've done this wrong and I want it to be covered by, by the forgiveness of the blood of your son. And I want to do that because I've got rights and you need to respect my rights, Lord. And I'm going to go do it again, but you know, forgive me now. Mm -mm. Romans 6 says, how shall we go to God that way? Shame on us who were once bought by the blood and then we want to go live back and forth in that world. You had not put anything aside. You're just looking for a license to sin. That's why you're serving me. Romans 6, paraphrase. Well, this man Cornelius admitted in verse 33 that he needed to learn something. He wasn't a know-it-all. He didn't look at God and say, God, you vindicate yourself before me. Explain yourself, God. I want you to tell me why this or that. He didn't make demands of God. He was a submissive servant to the Lord, and that was his attitude. Okay? Look at verse 33. Of chapter, of chapter 10. What did he say? Immediately I sent to you. When the Lord told me something, I, I immediately sent for you. He told me to send for Peter, a man who's lodging in Simon's house, and I did that. I sent for you, and you have well done that you have come. You didn't have to come. And yes, I know that you're under danger of the Jews, for even being in my house. But we are all here to hear you. We have come to hear you. Verse 33. We're here present before God. God's in their presence. To hear all things that are commanded thee by God. Now friends, do you come to services? Do you come to hear the God? Did you tune in tonight to hear the truth? You know, we hear a lot of people, and I, I think it's a common attitude among most people in the South. Now, preacher, you tell me like it is. Really? You want me to do that? Do you want God to tell you like it is? When he does that, what's your response? When the Lord tells you in his word, be baptized, what's your response? I'm not doing that. Do you really want the Lord to tell you like it is? Are you willing to submit, as Cornelius was, to what God says? Or are you just being blustery? I'll do whatever God says. Well, there's a rich young ruler one time thought he would too. What must I do, master? 
to receive eternal life. He said, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come follow me. And what did the young man do? He bowed his head down and he was shamed. And he went away sorrowful because he had a lot of possessions. Now that's a different man from Cornelius, isn't it? That young man was a Jew and he was devout. He had kept the law from his youth up. What a man! And the Lord tells him something. One thing you lack. I could only dream of having one thing that I lacked before God. But Jesus says this to this young man. One thing you lack. Money has gotten in the way. You're blessed with many things, and you've let it take you away from me. It's more important to you. It's standing in the way of you serving me. What is your one thing, folks? What is the one thing that you're not willing to give up for the Lord? Is it your family? Is it your friends? Is it your pride? We could just go on naming things. What's your one thing that keeps you separated from God? Cornelius was willing to hear all things whereby he might be saved. And that tells us something, that even though this man had the Holy Spirit, he wasn't saved yet, was he? It was the words that were spoken that were going to lead him to obedience. He was ready to hear what the apostle had in mind. The whole purpose of sending for Peter, remember the Holy Spirit had already fallen on them. But they weren't saved, were they? No. So if the Holy Spirit saves you without anything you have to do, then here's an instance where the Holy Spirit fell on somebody and they still weren't saved. But now he hears words. The words he hears are the words that will lead him to life, not the Holy Spirit falling on him. That's not going to do it. So what do we have here? Peter opened his mouth and he says of a truth I perceive God does not respect people. That's the whole indication. That's the point here. The gospel Peter announces through the Spirit speaking that God's not a respecter of persons. But in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted. Well now Peter why don't you stop right there? Because this man fears the Lord and works righteousness to others. He does right things to other people. Well, why was Peter preaching to this man? He was already okay if just being a good man is all you need. No, Peter's saying it's much more involved in the new law in recognizing what is good and what is righteous and what it really means to fear the Lord. To fear the Lord is to do what the Lord says. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now we've gone through already tonight five different things the Lord said about somebody being saved. And people balk at all of them. I don't have to do anything. I'm saved by grace. Or maybe I'll do faith. I'm saved by grace through faith. Or I'm saved by just saying I believe in Jesus as the Son of God and I accept Him as my personal Savior. Where is that in the Bible? Call in, tell us where that is in the Bible. I'll say the sinner's prayer and I'll be saved. You hear that all the time, but it is not in your Bible. You search your Bible, you'll never find anybody that said any such thing as a sinner's prayer in the Bible and was saved on the basis of them saying a sinner's prayer. By the way, do you know, have you ever seen a copy of what the sinner's prayer is? Do you know how many versions of that there are? Now I can show you what you need to do in the Bible, and we did, we've done that already tonight. What it takes to save somebody. And it says it in those words. It's not some thing that you can make up by somebody else saying it. Now, the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles was not to save them. It didn't save them. 
In Numbers 22, 28, there were people who had the Holy Spirit. 1 Samuel chapter 19, John chapter 11, verse 51, people had the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit didn't come to save people separate and apart from the gospel. Peter was sent to them to tell them what they must do. Verse 14, notice that passage. Peter says that, who shall tell thee words wherewith you and all your house shall be saved. Words by which you will be saved. Not the Holy Spirit wherewith you'll be saved, but words by which you'll be saved. Now, the words didn't save them. Obedience to the words did. So, the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles was to provide undeniable evidence that Jewish Christians were to accept Gentiles when they complied with the same law that they did. Now, so what does he say? He says, he will tell you what you must do. This was to Cornelius by the Holy Spirit, verse 6 of chapter 10. Peter lodges with one Simon the Tanner, who is in a house by the seaside. He will tell you what you ought to do. All right? One version says what you must do. In verse 22, you will be summoned. The Lord will send you to his house, and you will hear words from Peter. He will speak to you things commanded him of God. So the hearing of the gospel was essential for him. He will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Did the word save him? Verse 14, nope. But obedience to the words did, didn't it? What did Cornelius know? Look at this chart. What did Cornelius know? Well, Cornelius was a man that feared and worshiped God, verse two, chapter 10. The word that God sent to the children of Israel was sent to him. Verse 36, 37, and 42. And then look, if you will, peace through Jesus Christ was preached, verses 36, 37, and 43. In Acts 8, verse 40, the eunuch preached Jesus, and the eunuch came to the conclusion he had to be baptized. Jesus was preached as being Lord of all. Verses 36, 37, and 43. And the works of Jesus were preached. Verse 38, 39, and 40. So what did he know? What did Cornelius not know? That God had granted repentance to life to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews? That's in verse 18. And also Cornelius did not know the words God had commanded Peter to speak to them that those were things that he must do. Now he knew, but before this he didn't know. But now he knows, after Acts chapter 10, now he knows. Cornelius did not know that they too must be baptized in the name of Christ Jesus. They didn't, he didn't know the Gentile was to do the same. But he does now, doesn't he? And then look and see. When was Cornelius and his household saved, friends? Now there were those people that might say, well, he was saved when he heard the gospel or when the Holy Spirit fell on him. Well, wait a minute. After they heard the gospel, it says there, their hearts were purified by faith when they obeyed these things commanded them by God. All right, they were purified when they did what? When they obeyed the things commanded them by God. All right, so when were they saved? Were they saved when they just heard the gospel? Is he saved yet? No. He's not saved at all yet. Well, when was he saved? Was he saved when he believed the gospel? Was he saved after he repented? Verse 18. He needed to repent. What did he need to repent of? He's a devout religious man. He had to repent of the things he didn't know, not, do, not doing them yet. And notice here, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? 1 Peter 3.21 says baptism saves us. Acts 22.16 says you're still in your sins till you're baptized, Paul. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, Acts chapter 2. 
Acts chapter 11, 17, and Acts chapter 10, 47 and 48. These are words, and you must be baptized to be saved. The Lord hasn't changed His plan. The Lord hadn't changed and said, well, now these are Gentiles. They don't have to be baptized. You know what? We'll just not let anybody have to be baptized. We'll just let everybody just choose their own way to come to me. And uh, everybody's fine as long as they love me and as long as they say that everything's fine. Well, then it is fine. No, it's not. Okay? You must obey. The Gentile must obey the same law of Christ that the Jew does. And part of that is to be baptized in water for the remission of our sins. What was preached to Cornelius, friends? Jesus Christ. Acts 10, 36 through 43. What was the story of Jesus Christ? He died, he was buried, and he arose. The crucifixion was preached, verse 39. He was raised from the dead, verses 40 and 41. The resurrection was preached. Our accountability to God and to Jesus in verse 42 was preached. He's the judge of the living and the dead. And then also verse 43, he fulfilled all prophecy. And through him is salvation and through no other. Those are the things that are preached when Jesus Christ is preached, friends. So what was he told to do? Watch this, verse 6, he was told to hear. Verse 43, he was told that he must believe. In verse 15 of chapter 11 of Acts, repentance is important. And then in verse 48, he's told to be baptized. Now let's read those verses. So we're not just sitting out there and say, well, that sounds good because it fits what you say. No, let's look at what the Bible says. He shall tell thee what you ought to do. You have to hear him, don't you? He will tell you. And you need to listen, because he's going to tell you what you must do. Verse 43 of chapter 10, what do we see there? To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. All right. Is that all he says? No, remember he's already told him to hear. Now he says you must believe. Hebrews 11, 6 is almost parallel to that verse right there, exactly. Now verse 11, chapter 11, verse 15. Let's look here, because this is all talking about Cornelius too. And as I began to speak, Peter says, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us in the beginning. And then I remembered the word of the Lord said, John indeed baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So God has given them the like gift as he did unto us who had believed on him. Who was I that I could withstand God? Does Cornelius have to change who he is? Yeah. He's got to repent, doesn't he? Let's look at verse 48 of chapter 10. He commanded them to be baptized. Who did? Peter. Why was Peter sent to Cornelius? To tell them words wherewith they might be saved. And you're baptized by who? In the name of, or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Then prayed they him to tarry with them certain days. Were they baptized? Yeah. Because their faith moved him to obedience, didn't it? They knew that Bible faith is a work. And there is no such thing as Bible faith separate and apart from works, James 2. So we see there that hearing, believing, repenting, and being baptized is all found right here. Now did he believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God? Notice verse here. Being baptized in the name of the Lord of Jesus Christ is verification that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, isn't it? Absolutely it is. Can anyone forbid water? Notice this. Can anyone forbid water that these might be baptized? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Acts 10, 47 and 48. To him, Jesus Christ, all the witnesses, verse 42 and 43, prophets, the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, 
will receive remission of sins. Will receive. That's future. But you have to believe. When do you receive remission of sins? Turn to Acts 22, 16. It's not when Paul or Saul of Tarsus received a visit from the Lord Himself on the road to Damascus. He was told to go into the city and Ananias would tell him words wherewith he might be saved. He heard what he said. He was very sorry for what he had done. And he is told by Ananias in Acts 22, 16, now what are you waiting for? Or why tarry you? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. But Paul was a religious man, wasn't he? He was devoted, so was Cornelius. You see, good people can be mistaken, folks. I can, you can. We got to put our pride aside and recognize that could happen to any one of us. We can be honestly mistaken. We can be dishonestly mistaken. But I think most people in the world today are honestly going on a path that they think is the right path, but it's the wrong one. You look at the world today and how things are going. There's people that can be talked into anything, isn't there? I mean, you just think about it. How crazy is it for someone to tell us, and I'm not just doing this because of politics. I, you can go to heaven without being in a, in a particular party, but I want you to know something. It's just crazy. It's simply craziness for somebody to tell us that we can kill babies after they come out of the womb. That's nuts. That's not murder, really? Who said so? Well, somebody said that's not the same as murder. Wait a minute, the baby's breathing. And those same people that say that, that espouse that, said that the life starts with the first breath. But wait a minute, you've got a baby that's alive breathing. And mom says, I don't want it. Well, kill it. That's crazy. But do you know how many people believe that's okay? We've been swallowing that since 1973. We've been killing children in the millions since 1973. How can that be right? And how could somebody believe that we're not taking lives? You see, people will believe anything. Now let's look at religion. Somebody says, well, what does it take for me to be saved? Just say the sinner's prayer. Well, wait a minute, is that in the Bible? Nope. Well, where did you get that? Well, I got it from some fellow that used to do a tent revival up this way. He brought out the altar call and told everybody they had to come to the altar and say the sinner's prayer and they'd be saved. Well, where is that in the Bible? Did any of the apostles teach that? Nope. Well, why do you do it? Well, I don't know, because my church teaches it. Well, is that, what, is that what you're going to base your salvation on? Yep, because I'm going to stand with my ancestors. I'm going to stand with my church. Wait a minute, does the Bible authorize it? I don't know, but I'm standing with my church. Well, wait a minute. Did you come to hear all the things God has said to you? Are you looking at the Bible with the attitude of listening to what all of what God says? I don't think so, do you? You see how important it is that we use our reason that we reflect on things that God has told us the way God tells us to look at them. Now friends, we want to think seriously about this. Notice this Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and John 1 and verse 12 parallel that is here. Let's do Acts 2 for verse 38. He, he that repents and is baptized or repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ watch for the remission of sins. Now turn to John 1. Let's look at what Jesus says about that. John 1 and verse 12. Okay, got your Bibles? All right, it's getting fall time. Let's hear the leaves rustling, leaves in your Bible. Chapter 1 and verse 12, what does it say? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. Now how do those, how do we believe on his name? Notice they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Here it is in Acts 10, 47 and 48. Acts 10, 42 and 43, through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. They were baptized in the name of the Lord, Acts 2, 38. They were added to the body of Christ. 
They were baptized for the remission of their sins on Pentecost. So when does remission of sins come? Before or after faith? Does it come? When is a burial completed? Only when you take the, the casket to the, to the graveyard? The funeral's not over yet. You hadn't buried the person yet, have you? Well, we just, we intended to, but we hadn't buried him yet. Wait just a minute. So you're going to leave the body above the ground? Mm-hmm. Did you bury him? No, we intended to. We were going to. But you know, he was buried. No, he was not buried. He wasn't put in the ground yet, was he? Romans 6. Baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. He died to sin. We died to sin. We are buried in water for the remission of our sins where we receive the blood and we are raised to walk a new life. That's when we're saved. And it's a likeness of what Christ did. Christ died. He went in the tomb and he came forth from the tomb. Now when was Christ Christ's work accomplished when he did all of what the Father said, right? When he did all that the Lord said. His Father said, and he did the bidding of his Father. And so he must die. For this purpose I came, to die, to be buried, and to arise. That's what Jesus came to do. Well, the conversion of Cornelius, again, before conversion, Remember that Peter, or that Cornelius, was very pious, as we would look at it. He was a very good man, as we would look at it. He was a worshiper of God. He was benevolent, but he was lost. All right, go to the chart, please. All right, he was pious, he was a worshiper, he was benevolent, and he was lost before he heard the words wherewith he might be saved. After he was baptized, he was still pious. He was a worshiper. He was benevolent and much more. But now he's saved. Words wherewith you might be saved. And notice that because of the occasion offered by Cornelius to this Jew who normally would not have even entered his house, those in his household. Cornelius was really evangelistic before he obeyed the gospel. But was he saved because he had invited people to hear the same things he was going to hear? No. Only after he was baptized. Now friends, if that doesn't follow, please call in and let us know. If that's not what the Bible says, you call in and you let, the, let our operators know and give us a passage that we violated here. Cornelius wasn't saved until after he's baptized. Good, pious worshiper, benevolent man, had a good heart, but he wasn't saved. After he was baptized, all of that was still true. He didn't throw away the good things he was doing. He threw away the disobedience. He hadn't been baptized. He hadn't come under the law of Christ yet. He wasn't saved. Well, all the conversions in the book of Acts we've studied to this point, all of these conversions, people believed, they repented, they confessed, and they were baptized. In every instance, they were baptized. Baptism is the common bond in all of these. The other acts of faith, repentance, and confession are either stated or implied in the passage. But baptism is stated exactly that all of them were baptized. Now friends, why do people argue about baptism? Why do they do that? Why do people want to say that you don't have to be baptized to be saved? You're, or you're some type of water dog if you think you have to be baptized to be saved? Or some derogatory term, you old Campbellite? Why, why would somebody do that when the Bible is clear? The people at Pentecost were baptized, the Sumerians were baptized, the eunuch was baptized, Saul was baptized, Cornelius was baptized in his household, Lydia, the jailer, Saul of Tarsus, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, all baptized. 
for the remission of their sins. Why? Because that's what we have to have to be saved. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. We must be baptized to be saved. Now, let's look at some applications to this. We are not saved just because we're religious and just because we're sincere. And friends, one of the sad things that you find today is you find a lot of people, especially as they get older, that believe that what they did is enough. They don't believe they're bad, bad people, and the fact is they're not that bad as the world looks at it. But a person can be not that bad and still be lost, you see. We're not saved by how many good deeds we do. We're not saved by any amount of works that we invent or how many people we have helped or haven't helped. We are sa we're not saved by just doing good deeds. If that was all it took, then all of us could become very benevolent and be saved. You're not saved without hearing the gospel of Christ, friends. That's why it was so important that Peter go and was commanded to go to this Gentile's house, something that as a Jew he would have never done. But when the Lord told him to do it, he did it, didn't he? Now that flew in the face of everything Peter had always been taught by the Jews. So we not only have Cornelius doing something that seemed unusual, we find Peter doing something also that was very unusual. The Lord is making a large statement here in this passage that bigotry has no place in the body of Christ. Okay? No place. All men everywhere are, can be our brothers in Christ. There is no sin greater than another sin. But notice this, we can't bring our sins with us. We have to repent and put them off. And you can't come into the kingdom and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm this way or that way. That's just the way I was born. And now I'm baptized and I can keep living that way. No, no, no. You haven't, been, you haven't repented. You're a fornicator. You haven't repented. Can't do that. You have to turn from those things. See? Well, Holy Spirit baptism also is not for us today because it was promised. It was never commanded. It was promised to two groups of people, to those that were Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, and also to the Jews. Ephesians 4 and verse 5. God's not a respecter of persons. That's no, that's no big news. We know that from the Old Testament. But in Acts 10, 34, it was very easy for the Jew to think that he would be. But the Lord says in Acts 10, 34, we know that the Lord's not a respecter of persons. That was clear. We learned that tonight. And notice also we found out that Jew and Gentile are saved the same way. They're not under different laws. They're under the law of Christ. One law, the law of Jesus. Also tells us the old law is put away. This is a walking example. This is a vivid example of how the old law is no longer valid. Also, we found out tonight in our study of the, of the life of Cornelius and his conversion is that we're not saved by faith only, friends. Because if we were, God would have never sent Philip or uh, Peter to talk to, uh, to even talk to, to Cornelius. Also, we found out that baptism, which is immersion in water, is a command that must be obeyed. After all that Peter had said, imagine if Cornelius had said, "I'm not doing. I'm not going to be baptized. You run along. I believe everything you've said except that." He wouldn't have been saved, would he? Okay. Baptism must be in the name of Christ. And that, baptism into Christ, is not Holy Spirit baptism. Baptized into Christ's name or by the authority of Jesus Christ is not Holy Spirit baptism. Acts 2 verse 38, Acts 8 16, Acts 10 48, and Acts 19 5 and 6. Notice in Acts chapter 8 and verse 16, that the people that were baptized into Christ had not yet received gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Peter was sent up there to lay hands on them, so that they might be able to have the same gifts. You see, Philip couldn't lay his hands on them, had to come by the laying on of the apostles' hands. And that tells us that the gifts of the Spirit, after the time of Cornelius, 
were shown by the lay or given by the laying on the apostles' hands. Not baptismal measure. And how was baptismal measure shown in both the opening of the door of the gospel to the Jew and the Gentile? Speaking in tongues. But later on, speaking in tongues only came through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Acts 8. Well, let's look on. Cornelius wanted to learn more after he was baptized. To all of you who are new converts to the gospel, I want to ask you something. Why don't you want to continue to study God's Word and grow? You think it's a one and done thing? You get wet, you come up, your sins are forgiven, and certainly that's true if you've done it from the heart. But do you think that all of a sudden you don't have to read the Bible anymore? You don't have to grow? Did you know growing is a commandment? Hebrews 5, after reason of time, you ought to be teachers. How are you going to get to be a teacher if you don't study what you need to know? The Lord says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Give diligence to show yourself approved of God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing involves not just taking passages out of context, say he said it here, but, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to obey that passage and no others. No. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We have to study it. And why in the world a Christian would not want to grow in Christ and to learn more about Jesus Christ, to hunger and thirst after righteousness? That doesn't go away. It's not one meal and it's over. It's a constant lifestyle, folks. And many of us who are Christians need to learn that. And we need to be hungry for the truth. And we're not going to be the type of people that have to be coerced to come to church services. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I want to ask you that question tonight. Let's ask the same questions. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Have you confessed Jesus as the Christ with your mouth? Romans 10. Have you by faith obeyed the truth in repentance and baptism for remission of your sins? Not just being baptized to be in a church. But have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? Are you seeking to grow spiritually? 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10, like we talked about. You've been granted repentance unto life eternal. If you've been saved, as the Lord says. So, repent. Have your, have, has your soul been purified by faith today through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And that's the only way it is purified. That blood has to be applied to you, and it's applied in baptism. In Acts 15, verses 6 through 11, in the controversy that came up at Jerusalem over circumcision, we find here that, that Peter and James and Paul stand up and they give a defense. They say the apostles and the elders came together to consider the matter of whether the Gentile was under the law of Christ or not. And this is the whole matter, okay? Did they need to be circumcised or not? And so when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just like he did to us. Okay, you got that? Now this is Peter recalling what happened that, that we have just studied. And so he goes on, and he made no distinction. God made no distinction between us, the Jew, and them, the Gentile, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke, the yoke would be the old law, and obedience to it, on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, friends, those of you who believe that we're saved by grace only, I want you to look at verse 11. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. The same manner as who? We just studied it. We just studied Cornelius. How is he saved? Not by just getting the Holy Spirit, the baptismal measure of the Spirit. Not by miracles being worked in his presence. Not by words being spoken. By, by his obedience to those words, 
his submission to God, his repentance, his faith, his confession that Jesus is the Son of God, he's acting by his authority, and then his baptism into Christ for remission of sins, that is called the grace of the Lord Jesus. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus we shall be saved in the same manner as they were. Let's go to the Jew. Well, how were the Jews saved? Because what happened to Cornelius and his family was like what happened in the beginning. They heard the gospel. They were convicted by it. They realized they had taken and crucified their Messiah and they were sorry for it. And they were told to repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ. In doing that, they were saved by grace. Now friends, did you get that? When they did that, they were saved by grace. I was saved by grace. Everyone who's a New Testament Christian is saved by the grace of God. But we dare not sit back and say that we can do what God has done. We have to do what He says. It's by His grace that He extends the, the invitation to us to come unto Him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, Acts, Matthew 11, 28-30. He'll give us rest. He'll give it to us. But we must receive it. And that's what happened here in Acts chapter 10. It happened in Acts 2. It happened in Acts 22:16. It happened in Acts 9, it happened in Acts 16, it happened in Acts 8, and it's happening all throughout time. The people are doing that and being saved by the grace of God by faith and repentance and confession and baptism. Baptism is the completion of the action. And you are not saved, friends, unless you have completed the action of obedience to the Lord. Therefore, you are not saved by grace if you have not been baptized for the remission of your sins. So don't say, I'm saved by grace, if you've not done what God says. Because this passage tells us, as Peter relates it, he was involved in both situations. And he says, we're saved by grace. When we believe that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they were. So grace is not received until you are obedient to what God has said. If I wanted you to have my remote control right here, I could say this is free to you. It's a gift. I will give it to you. But you will never receive the benefits of this unless you do what? Unless you receive it. Until then, it's a gift offered but never realized. And wouldn't it be sad, and it will be sad, on the day of judgment, if the free gift of grace that God has given to all of us is not received by people. And the Lord says to them, depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. But Lord, I thought you saved me by your grace. Did you not read my book? Did you not read Acts 15? Did you not read what people did in the book of Acts to be saved? I told you. I gave you my gift of my son dying on the cross that you might be saved. But you were too hard-headed to give up your old ways. You're too hard-headed to walk away from You did not hear, come to hear what I said. You came to tell me what you wanted it to be. You know, I've heard people say, I don't care what the Bible says. I believe what I believe, and I'll believe it till I go to answer to God, and He'll say, fine. Boy, that's a lot of assumptions, isn't it? No Bible, a stack of Bibles 20 feet high, won't matter about what I feel inside. You ever heard somebody say that? You might have said that. Really? Cornelius didn't say that. He came to hear. Words that the Lord told Peter to say. What is this? These are words that the Lord told us to read. And reading, we may understand what the will of the Lord is. Right, here's the map, folks. 
the map to eternal life right here. God gives it to us. We can read his whole story and know what we need to do to go to heaven. Cornelius was our ancestor. He was a Gentile. He was not saved by just being a good, being a good person, a benevolent person. He was saved in the same manner the Jews were, by coming to Christ and being obedient to his gospel. On the first and third Tuesdays of each month at 8, 8 p.m., we come to you on this program and we plead with you. We beg you. We ask you. We invite you to receive the invitation of Jesus Christ, to come to him and be obedient to his gospel, to be saved by grace through faith and the obedience of the gospel of Christ to the gospel of Jesus. Friends, in Acts 16, 1 through 40, two more examples are given of Lydia. Lydia was a devout woman. She was meeting down by the river to pray. The jailer was rocked to his core, again a servant of Rome, when Paul and Silas were in prison there for the things they had done in Philippi. They had taught the gospel and they were thrown in jail for it. At midnight, the jailer heard these men singing praises to God after an earthquake. And during an earthquake, they were singing. And they, he was ready to kill himself because he just knew that when their bonds were done, they were chained up, that they would all leave. Everybody in the prison would leave. And, and Paul said, don't do yourself any harm, friend, because under Roman law, the jailer was responsible for his prisoners. And if they escaped, it was his death was imminent. And this man said, men, what must I do to be saved? Lydia and her household, when they heard the words spoken to them by Paul and Silas, they sincerely obeyed. They were good people. These ladies were very good people. She and her household, she, had, she was over 300 miles from Thessalonica where she lived. And she was visiting there in that town. She was a businesswoman traveling. But it came time to study the Bible with the people that she knew. And so she, she studied the Bible with them. They were praying and they were studying. And Paul and Silas came to them and preached Christ to them. What'd they do? They were baptized. Why? Because Christ was preached to them. Words by which they might be saved. And with the jailer. He, was, he said, men, men what, shall, what, what shall I do to be saved? And they taught him. Paul and Silas taught him. The jailer washed their stripes and cleaned, cleaned them up. And notice that he and his household, all those that heard what Paul and Silas had said, that were responsible to God, they were baptized for the remission of their sins like others did. So we see here that the gospel when preached and it sinks into the heart of that good and honest soul, that good soil, that it will produce a Christian and only a Christian. So as you and I think about tonight what we have heard, let's think sincerely about where we stand before God. Are we people that are good people? I think most of you who are watching tonight are basically good people because you could turn to any number of channels and you may still do that. But the gospel will still be there for you to obey, won't it? Now, what will you do? If you're a good person, you will examine what you believe. You will want to hear more about Jesus. If you're that good soil that has been maybe poisoned temporarily by the thoughts of men and by the, what men have said about salvation. You need to examine yourself honestly and say, really, where is the Bible passage for this? All right, Where is the passage for what I've been believing all my life? Where is that found in the Bible? And then if you find it not to be in the Bible, what will you do? Notice the centurion did not say, I don't want to do this. He submitted to what the Word of God said, to the teaching he was given, 
Not because it was Peter, because he was one of the prominent apostles, but because these were the words of God. And, the, and notice Cornelius indicated that. He was told that Peter would tell him the words of the Lord, the words that he might use to be saved. So the process of salvation is the gospel is preached. It pricks the heart, and that's an inside-out job. I can't make your heart be open, nor could Paul, nor could Peter, nor could anyone. You have to open your door of your heart to the Lord. He stands at the door and knocks. But the handle's on the inside, folks. You've got to open the door. And then we have to give attendance to the things that have been spoken. We listen with the idea, this applies to me. Have I done it? And the obedient is judged faithful when he obeys what God has told him to do. There is action involved, friends. Things we must do to be saved. Have you done what the Lord says? The answer to the most important question in the Bible of what must I do to be saved is not just believe, faith only, like many are said, or have Jesus come into your heart, like many say, or just simply to confess that you're a sinner, or say some idea of a sinner's prayer. Again, where is the Bible passage where any of these things were ever told to a non-Christian in order for them to be saved? You won't find it anywhere in your Bible. If you do, between now and the next program, you write us, you let us know. You've been very kind to tune in tonight. We thank you for that. We know that it's something that is a privilege on our part for you to tune in and to study God's Word. We hope that you have found the things we've reasoned with tonight from God's Word to be true. Paul and Silas, when the jailer was baptized, they did that the same hour of the night. When you are converted, when you're ready to do what God says to do, you won't wait for a special baptismal service. You won't wait until Easter or Christmas. You'll be baptized the same hour of the night, and we're ready to do that. If someone is ready to be baptized for the remission of their sins, then you call and let us know. And we will do our best to get that done before this evening is over in the same hour of this night. If you will, just let us know. If you get to study in your Bible and you need help, we've given you the opportunity to go to the different sites we have here to let us know what you want to do. And we want to put that up again as we close out tonight. The Word of the Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. And if you will, come up here and we'll look at that. Contact at wordandsword.com. There's the mailing address. You get in touch with us and we'll help you be obedient like Cornelius was and like Lydia was like the jailer were. Thank you, and we'll see you in two weeks. Good evening.